Good evening and welcome to Conversations Live, Get Your Garden On. I'm Patty Satalia. The official start of fall is just around the corner. So are the chores and checklists for gardeners. Tonight, our experts will answer your questions and discuss what you need to do to prepare your garden for winter and get a jump start on next spring's planting. They'll also provide tips on ridding your landscape of invasive species. Our email address is connect at wpsu.org. If you'd like to join us on Twitter, you can tweet a question to at WPSU and use the hashtag conversations live. Now let's meet our guests. Tom Butzler is a Penn State Extension horticulture educator. He works with commercial horticulture operations and the landscaping community and he's based in Clinton County. His area of expertise is vegetable production and beekeeping. John Esslinger is a county-based extension educator with Penn State Extension. He works with fruit and vegetable growers and in greenhouse production. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thanks, Patty. Let's start with a, a quick synopsis and assessment uh, of this growing season. What kinds of problems and, and good fortune were you hearing about in the field this year? Uh, I think every growing season is a little different, but there are a lot of similarities, and, and we run into uh, the usual vegetable disease issues. Um, I know in previous shows we talked about late blight on tomato. We didn't see too much of that this year. It was kind of late coming in. I actually got in. scald this year. Okay, all so. right. So we didn't see too much late blight, but we did see early blight on tomatoes. That makes its yearly presence. Uh, we did see some phytophthora on um, uh, peppers, cucumbers, butternut squash, uh, the usual insect activity um, on, the, on the sweet corn, uh, the corn ear worm. So we had the run of the mill problem. So I don't think there was anything out of the ordinary uh, other than late blight not really being a problem this year, which is a good thing. I mean, tomatoes are probably uh, the most popular vegetable grown here in Pennsylvania. So uh, by homeowners at least. Mm -hmm. Right. So how about for you, John? What did you see? I saw two, two very distinct years. The very first half of the summer was, was wet. I mean, we had a good planting season in May. It's a little bit dry. And then June and July were, were extremely wet to the point where we had problems in the fields with crops dying just from being too wet. Yeah. And then the middle of July, the rain shut off and things got dry, the ground got hard, and, and that's people that had irrigation were able to survive that. But uh, you know, some of the, the pumpkins and things that aren't typically irrigated, they suffered. Um, but it was, it was a very unique season in that it was very, very wet and then very dry. Right, mixed bag. So uh, we promised viewers and listeners that we would give them tips on getting a jump start on next spring's planting. And of course, uh, this is a good time of year to think about that. I wanted to talk about a friend who is moving from one place to another. Uh, where she's going, there is no garden, so she's starting from scratch, and she wants to know, does she till in the sod? What can she do now? What does she have to do before the first frost? And what can she wait to do until next spring? And I'll begin with you, John. Uh, first thing we always recommend, you, you get a soil test. You, you don't know what fertility, the pH of the soil, until you get a soil test. So get that soil test. Uh, you can get them in any extension office. They're $9. Um, and, and here's an example of what one might look like. So it right. tells you how much, what your soil pH is, your phosphate level, and, and so right. forth. And, and what's not shown in that picture is they'll actually give you the recommendations. Of, okay, f put on so many you know, pounds of lime per, per 100 square feet. Um, so they're they're very educational, you know. When you, especially in a spot where you don't know what the fertility takes the guesswork is. out of this. Yeah. The second thing that I would do is is start thinking about how you can destroy the existing vegetation. You know, if it's grass, you know, putting down, you know, cardboard, paper, um, uh, even going over it with a tiller now to start to to kill that sod and work it in. Um, that way, you're going to have a nice bed that you can get into next spring. Um, but yeah, the, the most important thing is get that soil test and apply the lime, if, if it needs lime, apply that this fall. Lime takes time to work, and so get that, and if you can work that in a little bit, even better. Okay, and, and can you add anything? What? Well, I think you know th th those are some good recommendations for someone that's starting new, but for those folks who already have gardens, I think there's one thing that we really are encouraging more people to look at is this idea of cover crops. So once this season is done and you're, you're done harvesting your tomatoes or whatever crop you have in there, consider putting in a cover crop that will stabilize the so soil, add organic matter, maybe tie up those nutrients so they don't leach away or wash away so they'll be there for next year. What's a good cover crop? Well, um, you know, there's a lot of cover crops you can plant 
uh, it's a little late for some of them, like uh, uh, like buckwheat. It's a little late, but uh, winter rye, annual rye, or winter wheat, annual rye. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple you can plant September and October, and you know they'll germinate and they'll you get some vegetation in the you know dead of winter. Not much is growing, and some of them will make it through the winter and then start growing again. And then spring. these are easy to turn over in the in the spring, and and they add nutrients to your soil. Yeah, they add. There's a lot of benefits to them. Add nutrients or tie up the nutrients. They add organic matter. Uh, you know, prevent soil erosion. So there are a lot of things there to, and, to consider. And they look nice. My wife likes a, a cover crop in our garden because she said it looks pretty. <laughs> So, okay, one more important. reason. Yeah. Uh, we go to Rhonda, who is uh, calling us from State College. Rhonda, what's your question? I realize you're talking about gardens, but I would like to know um, uh, about my yard. I'd like to do a little less mowing. What can I grow in my yard as a cover crop for that, or not really a crop, but to cover my yard? So in place of mowing, she wants to do less mowing. Is there a recommendation for what she might grow instead of grass? Uh, there are the opportunities are, I mean, there's a lot of different plant material you can grow. I mean, there's a lot of uh, perennials out there that, um, uh, you know, will cover areas pretty quickly uh, and then act like a cover crop as, you know, it'll stabilize the soil, provide uh, cover to the ground. Um, I, I guess really what, what do you want? Do you want a, a, a perennial that's kind of like a herbaceous perennial um, such as... Um, uh, I, I, like a juniper. Well, that's a woody ornamental, but yeah, juniper. Something that you can actually walk on. Uh, uh, is that your interest? Do you want to be able to walk on this? Okay. Uh, she's no longer with okay. us. But, you know, I've got growing in my yard and not something I actually wanted uh, is a juga. And I know that some people use that. Actually, we have a picture of it if we can show that. Uh, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it properly, but some people are using that yep. in place of grass. It's sort of a purpley, yep. broad-leafed uh, plant. Yep. I mean, it, it's got some good characteristics in that it will cover the soil, relatively, or an area, relatively quickly. However, some folks will put it into a landscape bed, you know, like where your flower beds are, and then it will creep out into the lawn. So it can be a little aggressive, but yeah, it can take the place of, of turf, and then you don't have to mow it. Uh, you don't have to fertilize it like you would with, with grass, so that is an alternative. There's a lot of things out there, uh, a lot of publications, fact sheets on, on grass or turf alternatives if people are looking at that. Speaking of turf, John, you brought in a, a number <clears throat> of examples of problems that people are seeing in their turf grass this yeah. year. Uh, one of them is... Uh, Nimble will. Nimble will. Yeah, N nimble will is is a tough uh, grass. It's um, it's a perennial grass that will be in your your yard for for several years, and it starts out as a patch, and the patch just keeps growing. We have a picture of that too. It, and what what's bad about it is it's it's very crab very slow to to uh, green up in the spring. So you'll have these big brown, like, almost looks yeah, like that. There patches. it is on the. Yeah, uh, the, the it's on, browner. Yeah, the browner picture on my example. right. Example, and, and it looks like stems. You don't really see a lot of leaves on it. Um, and, and in the dry weather, that that actual sample came from my yard. <laughs> um, but in the dry weather, it turns brown. It turns brown. It's it's brown in the spring. It's brown in the fall. It's just a very ugly. Um, and it's tough because it's it's a grass growing in your grass, and so. Um, the only way to kill it is to actually get in there and, and tear it out. You can use a like a, a a non-selective herbicide like Roundup to kill it first, or you can just go in, and I, I've done this, just go in with a tiller, till it up and then plant a desirable grass. Um, but if you leave it alone, what happens is those patches just slowly get, get bigger, bigger and bigger over time. And of course, next to it is, is crabgrass. Yeah, crabgrass is a good year. The crabgrass likes, seems to like the dry weather, or tolerates the dry weather, and uh, yeah, it, it was everywhere this year. It was a tough year for crabgrass, yeah. Yeah, and that, that's a preventative thing. You need to prevent that in the spring um, and, and the preventative herbicides are very effective on it. Speaking of preventative, we're hearing more and more these days about uh, invasive plants. These are uh, plants that uh, grow quickly and aggressively and are overtaking native plants. Sure. Uh, so let, let's talk a little bit about the ones that are in particular worrying you, John. And I think you brought some examples well, of some things that we'll, we'll see in our landscapes. Yeah. Um, Japanese knotweed, um, a lot of people call it Japanese bamboo. That That's extremely invasive. Um, it, it's amazing. Uh, I first saw it several years ago up in the Lackawanna County area. 
it was you know probably 15 years ago it wasn't in Columbia County and now it's, it's virtually everywhere in Columbia County it particularly likes wetter areas along the creeks um, you know near near ponds things like that um, extremely heavy root system uh, we have a picture there and you can see that it comes up from rhizomes and so you cut one off and it just puts a new rhizome up and it just keeps going um, you know that that piece of root is broken off but but those roots will go down several feet and they're very very heavy and a lot of storage there where you don't see this weed doing well is in tilled areas um, so it, it's not a problem in farmers fields they might have it all around the edges but it won't it doesn't tolerate the tillage in the field you um, see this along uh, streams and, and creeks yes. in Pennsylvania. Yep. Yep. Very, very much so. Yeah. Also the purple loosestrife, which is another invasive that right. people look at it and they say it's beautiful, but it's actually causing a lot of problems. Look, and it, it's often yeah. in huge fields and especially, as take, I said, along streams. Yeah. Take takes over areas. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons that uh, uh, they got spread out uh, from wh wherever they were originally brought is that they're so attractive that people will move them about and put them into the landscape. I do want to say one thing about the Japanese knotweed is that I work with a lot of beekeepers and the beekeepers will chase that Jap Japanese knotweed as it goes into flower um, because it does provide a, a, a good nectar source and they can make a good load of honey out of that. So as, uh, as that starts popping up or flowering along the creek sides, you'll have the beekeepers will start moving their hives uh, along. So, so this is going to be a little confusing for people. There are actually some benefits to these things, which I think might be why everyone isn't just ripping it out. They well, like it's, the a, way it looks. it's a minor benefit. Okay. I think I think some of your beekeepers are taking advantage of it flowering. But you know, as John said, it is pretty aggressive. Uh, those deep rhizomes it can colonize an area. They grow rapidly and throw out a lot of shade to the point where nothing can grow underneath it. So your native vegetation just basically just just withers away until it's a pure stand of Japanese knotweed. And, and it's hard to kill because it, it comes up from those roots. And a lot of people will spray it with something like, you know, a, a non-selective like Roundup. And Roundup's not effective on it early in the season when it's, when it's growing. Um, now what, when it's flowering is a good time if you were going to try to spray it. But just one spray of Roundup which normally will kill most plants, will not kill this. And the key really is to remove it before it's a big problem. So you see one stand right. of go this. Exactly. Go after it right now yeah. and not just take it out, but put something in its place because invasives seem to go where the soil has been disturbed, yep. where there's nothing there. And, and if you leave any of the root, you, you didn't get rid of it. So you, you got to get all the root system out. Okay, you brought another, I think, um, uh, invasive that you wanted to tell us about. Uh, let me see what that was. The autumn olive. Oh, autumn, uh, yes. Yeah. How could I forget? Um, autumn olive is, is a, uh, it, it's a very shrubby. It actually has a, a little spine on it. It can be, uh, you know, very, very uh, uh, sharp on your hands. Um, but those, those little berries are attractive to the birds. The birds eat them, and then they go through the digestive system of the bird, Un untouched and then wherever the droppings fall then you'll have new plantings. So a lot of times along fence rows, um, along the edges of woods you'll see them where the birds have been roosting in the branches and then the autumn olive comes in. Um, again, it's a very tough plant. I mean it doesn't get hurt by the winters. Um, it's a very fast grower. You can actually, like I have some in my pasture and I'll bush hog it off and a few weeks later it comes right back again. Um, I think part of the problem, too, is that a lot of the plants that you've just shown us, they're attractive, and most of us pick things for our landscape based on their flower, uh, not necessarily thinking about what the impact to the environment might be. Yep. So what's a better way to pick a plant for your landscape? Well, uh, I guess I think today we're well aware of, of, of the problems with invasive species. So when new plants are coming into the United States for the nursery industry, they are evaluated for their aggressiveness. You know, how quickly are they going to spread? Um, is it going to be a potential problem? That doesn't mean you can't find invasives at your local nursery. Well, you know, and that's an interesting point, Patty. You know, as you go from state to state, there are some um, uh, laws in place to prevent the sale of certain uh, uh, plants. So, for example, burning bush, um, you know, the, 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 they're green during the, the summer months. And, and it a turns beautiful red in the fall. Beautiful red. You go to some states and you cannot buy burning bush. It's, it's just on the prohibited list of, of being on sale. But in other states, it's not yet there. 
So I guess it's just one of those things where you just try to educate the public on, on some of the potential problems. You know, you go out into a Pennsylvania forest and you can see on a hiking trail, you can see burning bush out there. You can see um, barberry uh, plants out there, you know, slowly uh, colonizing certain areas. So And they're out competing the native species. Yes, exactly. So, you know, I think it's one of those things, just like recycling maybe four or five decades ago, where it really wasn't started, but, you know, there's a lot of educational effort and I think it's kind of the same way with some of these plant species that just need to educate people. Okay. And uh, we've got an email question. This one for you, John. <clears throat> ben writes, I planted an apple tree uh, last year from bare rootstock. My brother's dog chewed the tree off about two inches above the graph last fall. It has started to regrow this year. Should I have any expectation that it will produce a nice tree or should I remove and replant? If I keep the tree, what are some things I can do to promote good growth? Never heard of a dog uh, okay. chewing uh, a tree. Maybe chain up the dog. <laughs> yeah, growth, yeah right? that's the first thing, chain your dog up. Um, it, it all depends on where did that sprout come from. If it came from below the graft, then it is the rootstock, and I can tell you those rootstocks are not anything desirable at all. Um, think of a gnarly old crab apple that's, that's kind of rubbery. That's probably what you're going to end up with. Um, if you are really ad adventurous and you wanted to try to graft onto that rootstock, you could still do that. Um, we do have a nice publication on grafting, and you can you could graft a desirable variety onto it. If if it is above the graft, then yeah, let that grow, and that can start a new tree, and and it'll take a little bit longer to to get back to where you were, but that'll be perfectly fine as far as the tree. But it, it just all depends on is it above or below the rootstock the graft. Okay, and I think we have another email question, this one about uh, uh, the soil samples, which we talked about just a moment ago. If we can get that email uh, up. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So we have a, a different email. This one is from, uh, is from Janice, another crab apple tree question. Will a crab apple serve as a pollinator for named variety apples? My two very old apple trees have succumbed to fire blight. One variety survives. I have three kinds of crab apples nearby. Yeah, cr crab apples are excellent pollinators. Um, it, it, farmers will sometimes put in, in, you know, space them out in the field. Uh, a, a crab apple just to help with pollination. So, yeah, that's a very good pollinator. You know, that email brings up an interesting qu uh, a point there about the fire blight. I I'm seeing more and more of that in the landscape uh, the past several years. And, and why do you suppose that's the case? I, I'm not real sure. I just. La it, last year, not, not this past spring, but the spring before, we had the absolute perfect conditions for, for fire blight. And it was everywhere. And if you didn't do a good job of pruning it out, then it was back again this year. But it's just not in commercial uh, food no, I, orchards. I mean, that, you can go walk on the Penn State's campus and see ornamental pears, crab apples right. that are being affected fi uh, by fire blight. So it's it's affecting both homeowners and um, uh, commercial uh, right. growers. So the minute you see it, cut it, and how far back on the on the branch should you go? How aggressively? We say about about eight inches. You know, the the width of your your hand. Um, and at least that. And, and the ideal thing is if you can do it right away, as soon as the strike hits, that's the ideal time to do it. At this point in the season, if you had fire blight that got in in the spring, the best thing to do is wait until dormant, you know, when it's cold outside and prune it out while it's cold, but below 45 degrees. Okay, and we do now have that, that email question <clears throat> that came in a little bit ago about uh, the soil tests, if we can see that now. Uh, who does soil testing? Can it be done by homeowners? My lawn was also damaged by grubs last year, and I do get the lawn professionally treated by a local company here in Johnstown, but I also have had moss for a few years. So let's deal with two things. I'll, I'll ask you first about the soil test, Tom. Uh, uh, John had put up um, a, an earlier picture, a slide of a soil test, and that was one done by uh, Penn State. We do have a facility here on campus that... And every county office what, Right. Can you can this. pick up the soil test kit at every county extension office and, and take that home. There's directions. You fill that up, and then you, you mail it up here, and, and they'll run the analysis for you. And as John said, they'll, they'll give you the, the results and recommendations. But there are some private companies that do that also. And so, I mean, it's just not Penn State that does it, but some private uh, companies that will uh, do soil test. I'm not familiar with the cost on those. Uh, and a lot of our commercial well, What does the one for, through your extension office cost? That's $12, I believe. Nine. 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 Okay. okay. Yeah. Yep. Sounds Nine like dollars. a bargain. Yeah, yes. it's, and it's, it's yeah. a good thing to do because otherwise you're just you're, you're doing things blind. 
you have no idea what you're, you're putting out there. So, for example, in that email, she talked about she was having moss uh, problems. Now, moss can be a couple different issues. It could be too shady. It could be too wet or damp, and nothing else really grows there, so moss will come in because I mean, you know, nature abhors a, 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 an empty mm -hmm. niche. Or it could be that the pH is out of whack, and how would you know that unless you do a soil test? So, uh, yeah, I mean, we always say that every, every show we're on to, to, to get a soil you test. You can't emphasize enough the need to... Uh, the importance of it, yeah. yeah yep. to, to make your decisions based on good information. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another email. This one comes <clears throat> to us from Michael. Uh, he's talking about another. This started off as the state's beautification plant and is now considered an invasive. He writes, how can I get crowned vetch out of my juniper bed? Are there any herbicides that will kill the vetch but not the juniper? I, you know, I'm not real familiar with any herbicides that are going to distinguish the juniper plant from the crown vetch because they're both what we call, you know, they're not a, a grass and a broadleaf. They're kind of lumped in with those broadleafs. So, you know, your, your broadleaf herbicides are not selective enough to just go after crown vetch and leave your junipers alone. Now, there may be an exception out there, but I'm not aware of any. I, I'm not either. So, I really. Had the same call in the office yesterday. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, so, really, it's going to come down to some grunt work where you're going to have to go in there with, uh, you know, some gloves and start pulling uh, the crown vetch out and, and, and manage it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure of any other way to do that. Okay. Everyone is emailing us tonight, <clears throat> not calling. Uh, I've got this new one from uh, Bobby who writes, I've read about a very aggressive invasive plant called hogweed. The plants can get huge sometimes, growing to around 15 feet tall, but what's even worse is that it can be very toxic, much worse than poison ivy, oak, or sumac. Within 15 minutes of contact, skin can become deep red and blistered. In some cases, it can even cause blindness. It is moving into Pennsylvania from New York. Has it invaded central Pennsylvania yet? That's a good question. It is in Pennsylvania. I have not heard of any reports of it in, in, in central Pennsylvania. I have not seen it yet. But it is a it is a giant plant. I mean, the leaves on these things are, are massive. And, uh, you know, I've seen some pictures of them and where the, the plant is a good, what, maybe 10, 15 feet mm -hmm. uh, tall. And, you know, one of the problems they were having with it before they really knew what was going on, the kids would get it as like a pea shooter, put it up to their, their mouth, and you'd get this inflammation of the, the tissue around the, the mouth area. So he is correct, or she is correct uh, on that um, uh, the description about the, the um, skin issue. Rash, yep. wow. Yep. So how did it get here, and how did we get rid of it? If you see it, if you notice it, and everyone check your uh, Google this so you know what it looks like. Yeah, a, a good question. I, I think Pennsylvania at one time had something in place where they were trying to target the hot spots of this ho giant hogweed, and they would go out and, and, and eliminate them. I don't know if that's still in place or not, but you, you might want to Google that and see if that's a, a program they still have. Okay. All right. We now go to uh, Marlene. She's calling us from Kylertown. Marlene, you're on the air. Good evening to all of you, and thank you for taking my question. I have a Stanley prune plum that has what I would call uh, black knot. Um, we have old um, wild cherry in our forest, and, and they are full of it. And I want to know what I can do about it, and when can I take care of it? John? Uh, bl black knot, uh, yeah, the, the first thing you've got to do is, is prune it out. Um, and again, just go, go about four inches below where the black knot ends uh, and prune it out. At this point, uh, I, I just wait until the leaves are off and the, and the tree is dormant. Uh, there are some, uh, a fungicide that is effective at preventing black knot, and that's... Uh, Can you describe what it looks like, please, John? Oh, it's, it's very distinctive. It's a big, black, like almost cancerous-type growth on, on the stem. It'll often be four or five times as broad or as wide as what the stem is. When you have it, you don't miss it. Okay. Yeah. Um, but if you spray chlorothalonil, um, and that, that's the same fungicide that, that is often sold as like a, t a tomato blight preventative. Uh, chlorothalonil, while the plant is growing in the spring, um, you know, once you have the new shoots starting and the shoots are starting to elongate, that's the time to keep some chlorothalonil on them. And you're probably going to be looking at maybe three sprays at about 10 days apart, and that will, will prevent new infection from and happening. And is weather an issue? Can you spray and have it rain the next day? Do you want it to be hot and dry? What, what conditions do you want to spray this in? Uh, you want it to dry on, but 
you know, if you put it on before the rain and, and in wet conditions is when the disease spreads. And so you actually want to have it on before the wet conditions happen. Okay. Not, not after. All right. We go to uh, Lay, oh, I'm sorry, Kay from uh, Loganton. What's your question, please, Kay? It's a futuristic question. I want to know if you think that someday they will have herbicides and weed killers that will just go in and t like kill everything but the plant that you're trying to save. This sounds like, you know, with genetics as they are today, <laughs> I, that sounds I, like it could be. I, <laughs> Thank you for your call, Kay. All right. I, yeah, right, with, with the way uh, science is advancing and, and so forth, I don't see why not uh, that, the, you know, you have a spray that would specifically go after a grass within a grass and just um, we're not there yet. Um, and, and where she's going with this is a lot of the herbicides uh, you can't distinguish between much. So uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't interact with the chemical companies a lot to, to know where they are on something like that. How but, about you, uh, John? Yeah, I, I, I think it's going to be a ways in the future. Um, but it does bring up the point, it, we often see a lot of mistakes with herbicides. Um, and so, you know, take the time to read the labels, make sure that, you know, if you're going after a certain weed, yeah, for example, I had a neighbor that uh, used Roundup to kill dandelion in his grass, yeah. not realizing it was going to kill the grass also. Right. He, he had used a broadleaf weed killer in the past, and that only killed the dandelion. Well, and he thought he was using the same thing. Well, he had all these dead spots in his lawn. He's very embarrassed about the whole thing. But <laughs> it, it, it proves the point. We need to pay attention to the relabel, read about it, and find out exactly how it works. Uh, good point. But, yeah. If you're just joining us, I'm Patty Satalia, and this is Conversations Live, Get Your Garden On, on WPSU. Our guests tonight are Tom Butzler, a Penn State Extension horticulture educator, and John Esslinger, a county-based extension educator with Penn State Extension. Our telephone number is 1-800-543-8242, and our panelists are ready to take your phone calls. If you'd prefer to email us, our address is connect at wpsu.org, and you can also join us on Twitter by tweeting at WPSU. Uh, you know, we're, we're thinking about what to do, uh, you know, to winterize our gardens, but there really still is a fair amount of, of growing time left in the season. There will be a, a number of warm days left in September and a number of things that can go from seed to table in 40 days or so. So I was wondering if you could talk about uh, which vegetables we can grow right now, and, and what advice you have for doing that? I guess I should ask that of you, John. Uh, I, that short of season, you're locked into things like lettuces, uh, salad rad crops, ra radishes, things like that. Um, and one of the really wonderful things is row cover. Row cover can really extend the season. And if you are a little bit behind, it can kind of get you to catch up because it helps hold the heat in. Now, obviously, the last week or two, heat has not been an issue. Yeah. But, Hopefully here in you know a few weeks it's going to be, and so row, row covers will help extend your season in those situations. But yeah, I think we can still get some of those crops planted now, and, and still get a decent harvest. From so them. the spinach, the kale, the chard, those sorts of things will do well if you plant them now. Yeah, and they'll tolerate some frost. Uh, freezes will kill them, but frost you know doesn't doesn't seem to bother them too much. Now, are these things you need to plant? Uh, uh, indoors and then take back take outside or can you plant them directly in the ground right now and if so how deep should that seed be planted you can do it either way uh, radishes typically are not planted indoors but lettuces can be um, and the advantages to planting lettuce in, indoors is you know the spacing is, is mm -hmm. better um, you, you can get them up a little bit better you know get them started and, and take care of them kind of all that special care that they need right when they're starting, you can do that a lot easier when they're indoors and then plant that outside. The other thing is uh, I've had a problem with, I, I plant my, my fall lettuce right in the garden and then got a nice thank you note from the rabbits because they, <laughs> they ate it, just, it got about three inches tall and then it just ate it right down. If you, if you do seed directly into the garden instead of in a, in a tray like he was talking about, <clears throat> you'll probably have to go in and do some thinning because you do tend to see it a little heavier or you do the thinning when it's in the seedling tray and then you transplant in the soil. So that's one thing you may have to do is do some thinning, otherwise you have some overcrowding and 
It won't do as well. And, and how about, I'm going to take Kate's phone call in just a second, but how about fertilizing fall crops? Uh, just a, a regular 10-10-10 formula or, or it, something different in fall? Yeah, <clears throat> not a lot different, but just don't overdo it, light, light amounts. But the, the other thing we ought to mention is that in fall is when we plant garlic and there are some yeah, that's crops true. that yep. are going in. Uh, in the fall, so there's still quite a bit of gardening to do. Okay, good. Don't uh, don't put the trowel away yet. Right. Uh, Kate from State College, what's your question, please? Hi. Uh, okay, guys, I'm calling about powdery mildew. Um, I had it on my cucumber plants this year, and I took the, d the disease leaves off during the year and sprayed them with copper fungicide and controlled it for a while and then finally gave up. What I want to know is, was that the right thing to do? And also, are there things I can do now to decrease the chances that I have um, this happen next year? That Great I mean, that I'll have the powdery yeah. mildew. Yeah, well, powdery mildew is one of those diseases that doesn't overwinter here in our, our, our soils. It's coming in from, from outside the area. Oh. So, I mean, you're, one of the things you, you, were, you were scouting, it sounds like you were trying to observe that powdery mildew as it came in and you know that's a that's a key thing there um, to trigger your copper spray or your fungicide spray whatever you're you're, you're, you're utilizing so the other thing is um, you know when you're picking your vegetable crops you might want to look at the disease resistance package that comes with those crops you know there, there are some out there that are more susceptible uh, than others so for example for pumpkins uh, there are some out there that are, are powdery uh, mildew I wouldn't say resistant, but tolerant. tolerant. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, instead of spraying, if you're using a copper fungicide or something else, you may spray every 14 days instead of every seven days. It gives you a little bit of leeway. So, you know, whatever vegetable crop, you know, you might want to look at that disease package as a, as a possibility. Well, sort of as a follow-up to what Kate said, if, if this powdery mildew doesn't uh, survive winter in Pennsylvania, and, and let's say she composts, can she put her diseased plants in her compost pile and not cause a problem? For, for powdery mildew, that won't be a problem. But there are some other diseases you do have to be concerned about this idea of, of composting. But, yeah, powdery mildew won't be a problem. But, um, you know, we, we, when we're working with some of the, the growers out there, again, just as pumpkins as an example, you know, we tell, we tell them when you're walking through the field and you see one powdery mildew spot on one leaf out of 50, then that kind of triggers a, a, a spray application. So it doesn't take much, but it is a good idea to walk through that garden or that landscape and, and observe what's going on and then, and then take the appropriate action. We have some pink, uh, pumpkins that we're going to talk about in a minute, but but you wanted something to, I, yeah, uh, to add on. Yeah, another thing that, that helps, and this isn't a cure-all, but that does help, is, is overhead watering. I mean, typically we say, well, you know, wet the soil, not the foliage, because you're promoting disease. But with powdery mildew, it's the opposite. If you can wash some of that mildew off, it will suppress it. Uh, <clears> I, I actually did that with my pumpkins and saw a nice, nice response. It didn't get rid of the disease, but it kind of delayed it for a couple of weeks. But just, yeah, okay, just, good tip. Yeah. Uh, John from Kane, you're on the air. Yes, uh, I have two blueberry bushes in my yard, and they produced very well. I had 28 quarts off of the two. Good for you. They were, were very bitter this year. They were, they were sour. They, they, they weren't sweet. I was just wondering what I could do about that. And, and they were sweet the previous years? I mean, you never had any uh, problems? Yes, with other years they've been sweet. Hey. And you let them mature. I mean, they were fully ripe. Well, yeah, I don't. I guess I did. They were purple, <laughs> or they were blue. Okay, yeah, yeah right. They they need to yeah. be kind of a dark blue. Purple right. is that yeah, dark is, blue. Okay, right. okay. I, and John, did you notice any other issues with the plant? Did you notice any, um, you know, insects or anything like that? No, nope, they were beautiful. They're nice and green. I put some marrow acid on them in the spring, and mm -hmm. they greened up real nice. And they, they um, got new, new uh, buds on them and everything, or new leaves. And, and no discoloration on the leaves. No, the leaves are nice and green. Hmm. Something I've noticed with blueberries is if you pick them right after a rain, they aren't as flavorful. Right. But well, he said they we didn't were, have much rain. You didn't have year, much. So. Okay. Well, we're we're yeah. stymied. There are our guests yeah, are stymied. Yeah. The only thing I could think is if you know they might have colored, but may not have been fully mature, fully ripe. Uh -huh. um, you know, and, and it okay. does. The longer you can leave them out there, the sweeter they'll get. And you know, but 
there is that sweet spot as far as when to pick them, but. It could have just been in this environmental conditions just weren't. Yeah, I mean, we had plenty of sunny days for them to be producing, the plant to be producing sugars and send it to the, 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 the berries. Can, the heat can cause mm -hmm. funny things too. All right, we have another uh, blueberry question. This one comes from Roger. Uh, he writes, I have about a dozen blueberry bushes that are anywhere from two to five years old. About two weeks ago, the leaves on one of the bushes all turned brown overnight. The other day, I noticed the same thing happened to a second bush. Again, all the leaves were brown and dry. What could be going on, and might this spread to all the plants? Since it has struck two plants, am I already too late? Does that sound familiar? Well, I mean, the only thing that comes to mind initially is that blueberry plants, a root system is kind of shallow. Very shallow. And, yeah. and so if uh, mulch hadn't been applied every year or a, a, enough mulch, um, we had that rainy spell, roots are kind of close to the surface, they're doing fine. And then, like John mentioned earlier in the show, those rains shut off and it got hot and dry. And so I'm just wondering if maybe it was a, a, a lack of water uh, or you know, not enough mulch there to protect those roots. from. So what can he do right now so that it doesn't perhaps go through his whole, uh, all of his blueberry well, plants? Well, the fact that it rained today is, is probably going to stop the problem. Yeah, disease doesn't work like that. So I don't think it's a disease. It, it, it sounds like something environmental, yep. which, which the dry weather would explain it. Okay. The only other thing is, is possibly if you had some type of rodents or things like that that were or boring around underneath there that that added some extra stress, let some of that air in to help dry out the roots right. and cause that to happen quickly. Okay. So so maybe his other plants will, will do okay. Yep, and, and just apply so. mulch. They need a lot of mulch. Okay. Yeah, and once you start mulching, you've got to always mulch because you're it's that layer between the soil and the mulch is where the blueberry plant feeds. Okay, and what kind of and mulch are you recommending for blueberries? A, a, a rotted hardwood mulch. Hardwood, okay. Yeah, and no walnut. No walnuts. Yeah. Okay. I, I assume walnuts, uh, walnuts hard on lots of plants. It yeah. kills lots of yeah, things, right, so exactly. it's definitely not good for, uh, yeah, they have which a might explain why our blueberries don't do well. They're near walnut trees. Never thought of that. Okay, we go to Robin from Altoona. Robin, what's your question, please? Yeah, hi. Um, I apologize I don't know the, the correct name for the plant, but my father-in-law calls it stink plant. It's very, very invasive, and I need some suggestions on how to get rid of it. Do you know what she's referring to? Did she say stink? Stink plant. Stink that's, plant. that's the, uh, let me see. If I... No, I, I don't know of any common name for, for stink plant, but everyone, you know, everyone, a common name, you know, everyone's got different common names for Someone's plants. Someone's saying it to me in my ear that I have to say it again. Say that again. Stink plant. Emulphias titanum. Does that ring a bell? I'm not pronouncing it right, I'm sure. Now, what's it look like? What are the characteristics well, of this plant? Well, it has um, green, green leaves that some of them will even turn a reddish. And it's on the ground, um, and it, they, it gets uh, pretty, pretty big. Um, it tolerates a lot of sun, and it just, when it grows, it just takes off, and the roots just go everywhere. Like, literally, I had it outside the fence of the raised bed gardens and it invaded in under and up through the so it's a raised bed garden. So it, so it flowers. So what, what do the flowers look like? Well, it, no, just the leaves. The leaves turn, the leaves turn like red, a real bright red. Um, and it stinks. I mean, when you cut, you even get near the plant, it, it leaves off this um, terrible odor. Scent. Hmm. Yeah. You know, the DCNR has uh, a database where you can mm -hmm. put some information in about an invasive, and perhaps if you go to that site, the DCNR site, you might be able to uh, uh, find out what what species you're talking about. Yeah, the other thing, this is Robin from Altoona? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, the other thing is, you know, you do have an extension office down there, and uh, we've got a, an extension educator down there that uh, you can either drop off a sample or just send a digital picture. Uh, digital pictures with cameras today, I mean, they're pretty, pretty clear, and uh, you can get good some idea. really good uh, characteristics in that picture. Uh, probably be able to identify it pretty quickly once we see a picture. But off the top of my head, the way you, uh, the description, I, I'm not sure what that is. Okay, where's the extension office at in Altoona? Altoona, they just moved a year or two ago. Um, yeah, if, if you went to the Penn State Extension website, there is a, a on the list on the left that it says the counties. 
and just then it'll come up with a picture of Pennsylvania. Just click on your county. Yeah, that'll it'll be, be Blair County. Yeah. It'll be Blair yeah. County, I think. Yeah. So, yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's Blair County. Good luck to you. Thanks so much for your phone call. Uh, thank we go. You. Yeah, thank you. We go to Lori, who's calling us from New Paris. What's your question, please, Lori? <clears throat> you there, Lori? Okay, I'm not sure if we have her. We will go to uh, Dick from Johnstown. Dick from Johnstown, are you there? Okay, yes, I'm Hi. on. Hi, what's your question, please? My question is this. I went to a box store this year. I went to a box store this year and bought my pepper and tomato plants in a biodegradable pot. Okay. Unfortunately, um, it didn't seem to me that they decomposed very well. I did buy a few tomatoes in the normal way and rooted and planted them. They did better. What has been your experience, if you have any, with buying peppers and tomatoes and uh, other sorts of plants and uh, biodegradable uh, so, Dick, you planted boxes. yeah you planted the plant in the biodegradable uh, and they pot. Claim that that's what you're to do. Yeah, but my peppers produced very poorly. Yeah, I've done that, but uh, I've ripped out the even bottom. We were able to grow through the plant, and the soil was uh, quite loose. I was surprised. Okay, Tom. Yeah, you know, I, I haven't, I usually start my own transplants or I put the plugs in with that. I don't use those those type of pots. But the only thing I can think of is that maybe that, that soil wasn't moist enough to, to aid in the decompos, uh, decomposition um, of, the of that product. Of that. Yeah. So that's about the only thing I can. So I've used them. Dick, was were the roots actually growing through the pot or into the pot when you planted? They were not. They were in the pot. Okay. They I, were not I, growing through the pot. Yeah, no. I, I think I would just take it out in the future. I would just take it out of that pot. As long as you don't, you know, damage the roots, take it out of that pot and and, and just like, like as if it was bare soil. Yeah, yeah, what I've done is really saturated the pot before I put it in the ground and then I ripped the bottom off of it. Yeah. I, I don't know if that... Uh... And, and, and especially a transplant, you want them to grow quickly. You want them to get out in that soil and really take off and if they've got to work their way to get through that pot, then that, that's going to slow them down. So a little, I, little bit of a barrier yeah. you know, for those new roots coming out. What okay. I've done, I, I've actually just, if, if they're actually, and sometimes you'll see them grow, the roots actually growing, starting to go through the pot or into the, into the pot, I just gently kind of rip it so that there's actually openings that the roots can get through and, and get out quicker into the soil. Okay, well, well good luck. You. That's very sensible. Yeah, thank you for your call, Dick. We I go know. to Marla, who's calling us from State College. Go ahead, please, Marla. Hi, thanks for taking my call. I have a vegetable garden, um, and several years back, I planted horseradish in one area, and, and then that year, I made the big mistake of rototilling my garden, and now I have horseradish plants everywhere. And no matter how much I dig them up, I can't stop them. They're growing laterally. The roots are growing laterally through the garden, and they pop up everywhere. Do you have any suggestions for how to get rid of the horseradish? Wow. Well, you know, that's kind of an excellent uh, look back on what John was talking about, the Japanese knotweed and those underground storage energy structures mm -hmm. that if you, you know, break them up, they can really start spreading. And uh, that's what's going on here within this garden. And other than, you know, manually, you know, digging in the garden, getting up those things out of the, these energy structures out of the soil, um, the other option would be some type of herbicide, um, you know, some sort of a... a you know, like a Roundup glyphosate product. Right. And if you use a herbicide, you have to wait until the plant has, you can't do it early in the spring when it's just coming out of the ground and it's got new leaves. Most plants are, are most susceptible when they're blooming. So if you can, if you can wait to that point and then, then spray it then. The other option is, is just put a stand out front and go into the horseradish <laughs> business. <laughs> there you go. Hey, you know, that, make, a, make lemonade out of lemons here. I do want to make a, a quick point on, okay. or the comment that John said on, on the flowering there. Uh, there is a growing body of evidence that, that honeybees are coming into contact with a wide range of pesticides. You know, mm. they're, they're visiting these flowers, and it's just not insecticides. It is herbicides. It is fungicides. So there is, I think, you do need some caution there when you're applying products that if the plant is flowering, you, you, you do need to be careful. Right, because bees are going to be visiting your flower, and we bees need all the help they can get. Right, so whether it's Japanese knotweed or whatever else you're, you're targeting, um, really? take that into consideration. When you look at Japanese knotweed and when it's in full flower, 
I mean, it's it's a cacophony of, of, of noise. I mean, there's all kinds of, of, of pollinators visiting these flowers. So um, some caution needs yeah, to be taken. Yeah, good, good, really excellent good point. Uh, Frank, you're on, is on the line from <laughs> Hillsdale. What's your question, please, Frank? Uh, folks, can you control alternaria in vine plants like honeydews and cantaloupes? It was an especially bad year. Uh, John? Um, it, yeah, Frank, I, Altenaria. Not, I mean, we see a lot of diseases, but we don't see Altenaria that often. How, are you, have you been, had a diagnosed? I mean, are you sure that it's Altenaria? Well, it appeared to be uh, identical to the Penn State disease book uh, pictures, for sure. Okay, and what we saw a lot of this year is angular leaf spot, and that would look very similar. And, and why, why that distinction is important is angular leaf spot is a bacteria. Yep. And so you would use copper to control it as far as a fungicide, where Altenaria is a fungus and you would use something like the chlorothalonil. Um, so, yeah, if, if you can, try, try to get that, you know, we have a disease clinic that's outstanding. You know, get that definitely identified. Um, and, and it could be Altenaria, but I'm, I'm thinking it might be more the angular leaf spot. All right. I lost, I lost all my melons before they were ripe, of course. Oh. Well, you know, the other thing that was going around was downy mildew. Yes. And, and, and downy mildew uh, affected a lot of our And we have some pictures of that uh, on, on watermelon. Right. Or on, on pumpkins. Pumpkin. I'm sorry, pumpkins. But it not only affects pumpkin, I mean, it affects all the um, uh, cucurbits. Um, so watermelons and cucumbers. And so that made an early president present in certain parts of the state. And that can take down a vine crop pretty quickly. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, a, that's another possibility, too. And they're very, very susceptible to downy. It definitely wasn't that. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, good luck to you, Frank. Thank you for your call. We go now to uh, Bruce. He's calling from Altoona. You're on the air, Bruce. Hello there. Thank you for taking my call. Great program. Uh, I got a question. I have a Canadian hemlock uh, in the backyard here, and it seems to be defoliating uh, rapidly. With uh, It has, like, little white... Uh, uh, flakes on the leaves there, on the needles there, and there's a lot of uh, needle drop and turning. It's turning brown and right. thinning out all over. Can you suggest anything to, uh, you know, treat it or just leave it alone? Well, uh, it, it depends on what kind of fight that you want to have with this. It, it sounds like with the description that you presented there that that is a hemlock woolly adelgid. It's an invasive insect. We were pre previously talking about weeds, but it... Uh, it attaches itself to the, the base of the needle, and um, it sucks out the, the, the plant juices, stresses out the plant, and you get needle drop. Um, you know, there are some insecticides you, you can apply uh, to the soil, and you, there's some things you can inject into the tree trunk, and there's some things you, you can apply to the needles, like a spray. So it's, it depends on how aggressive you want to be and how much money uh, and, you want to spend on and this. And this is a statewide problem. It is a statewide problem. And so what's going on is for those high-value trees, yes, people will, will put up that fight. But for those hemlocks that are kind of in the naturalized areas, you know, maybe 10 acres of hemlocks or along the stream banks, there's just not enough money to try to combat that problem. They are looking at some biological controls for that, but I'm not sure yet how effective that is at this time. Uh, so they are doing some research and, and some alternatives, but as of right now, I'm not, I don't know. Oh, does, right. the, does the Extension Office have information about the treatment there? Yes, yes. You can, you can call one of the extension offices. Um, some of that information is also available online. Penn State does have a series of fact sheets, and they do have one on the hemlock woolly adelgid, and so uh, you can get some information there also. All right. Good luck you. to you, Bruce. Uh, we go to an email question. This one comes from Rick. He writes, we have a nice stand, a nice stand of poison ivy at the border between a woods and grassy lawn area. What's the safest? I am allergic to it and most effective way to get rid of it. I've tried several things over the past couple of years with little or no effect. And lots of people are concerned about poison ivy because... Warmer climate seems to be making it really robust. Warmer climate and the increased CO2. There was mm -hmm. a, a paper out on that saying increased CO2 mm -hmm. levels is uh, making it more potent. But, uh, you know, too bad we can't have a conversation with Rick. You know, I, I wonder if he has tried the goats. Goat, the goats, goats. Goats can, you know, pen them in and they can do a pretty they good job. They can eat it and not get... Uh, they can eat anything, I oh guess. My. So, But, uh, you know, uh, other than hiring someone to do it that maybe is willing to tackle that problem and an herbicide is really it. I, I've had good luck with 
with 2,4-D or a, a 2,4-D a broadleaf killer type product. And, and the trick that I found is, is this time of the year is the perfect time to put it on. Yeah, it, it's, that's correct. It's taking the, the uh, nutrients down to the root, and so spraying it now, you do a very good job of killing the entire plant. Um, and again, it just depends on how effective he can get that material onto the leaves and uh, yeah, if, you know, if he was using an herbicide and, you know, not trying to hand pull or anything, he could stand a couple feet away from it and apply that product and... And, and be safe. And be safe. Okay. I mean, it, people tell you that, yeah, I can get within five feet of poison and ivy it. and get it. Mm -hmm. That That's not true. I mean, you've got to come into contact with it some way. Or get if the they burn it, skin. maybe if they yes. burn it, then you can move around in that gaseous form, but just by standing next to it. And, and, and don't burn it. Yeah, don't, <laughs> right? don't, no, don't no. burn it. So we go to uh, Jean from uh, Julianne. Jean, what's your question, please? Yes, ma'am. I have a, approximately a 20 foot Chinson King maple. It's a beautiful tree, but the bark split. And I'm wondering what caused it and how should I treat it? Uh, what, what kind of a maple was that? King, uh, Crimson King maple. Oh, okay, okay, sure. So this is with those pur purple leaves? Correct. Yeah, okay. You know, why it's splitting, and, and it, it, is it a new plant, or is it something that's been in there for a while and it's established? Oh, it's established. It's probably almost eight inch in diameter. It's a beautiful tree. There's no bugs or insects that I can see. Oh, probably a frost crack. Yeah, I was just going to, and so when did you first see this, this occur? I mean, has it been over the years, or was it all of a sudden this year? It's all of a sudden this year, about two, three months ago. It's about three foot long now. Okay. Yeah, I, you know, um, we just had a real brief conversation to the side there, and one of the possibilities is a, is a frost crack. Uh, it's just environmental conditions, and it probably occurred more than two months ago. You're just kind of seeing uh, what's going on at this point. But it's basically you, you have these temperature variations. Um, you have uh, moisture coming up into, uh, uh, you know, as you're coming into spring. And you just get this rapid expansion as you know, temperature differences, and you just got that cracking. And, of the and you see that in wood in your house, but is there anything he can do about it? No, and, and typically the tree heals, and it doesn't really affect the tree. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's a lot of sap now coming out of the where it's split. Is there any, any concern there, or put some kind of insecticides or sprays or anything on that? No. The thing we do with trees, you just kind of let them not necessarily heal themselves, but they kind of wall off those injuries. So you wouldn't want to do anything. I the mean, days of painting them with black tar exactly. are over. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, you talk to your grandparents and they would, right, prune, they they would paint it after they'd make a cut yeah. where there was an injury. So yeah, just, just let it go and, and, and let the tree deal with that injury. I mean, the only other thing you can do is, is just promote uh, plant growth so that if, if, you know, if we were in an extended drought, you'd want to maybe water it. I mean, you just want to make that plant feel at ease and, and, and let it grow, you know, healthy and normally. All right. Thanks so much, Gene, and good luck to you. I think we have time for one more call. So, Doug from Ridgeway, this may be our last call of the night. What's your question, please? Yes, I want to know about the grasses like uh, Zoe and all these ones you see in magazines and TV that only grow so high and main green and stuff. Are they uh, really on the mark? You're talking about these warm season grasses. Well, I don't know what they, you see them on TV and you see magazines, Zoe, you know, yeah. it's supposed to be, they grow a certain height, and le less mowing, all that stuff. Right, right. So, I mean, we can grow warm season grasses and really well in certain parts of Pennsylvania, but most of the turf grass that people are growing are, are what we consider the cool season grasses, tall fescue, uh, Kentucky bluegrass, uh, there's one other one there. Um, I'm drawing a blank, but anyways. Crabgrass. Carrot crabgrass. But there are cool season grasses. You know, they grow really well in the spring and really well in the fall. And sometimes when we get in the heat of the summer, they just, just brown out. And these warm season grasses, which mostly grow down south, uh, they thrive in, the, in this, these summer conditions. And they don't get as tall as, mm. like, you know, tall fescue. They're, they're a little more low growing. Uh, they creep along. So less along. mowing? Yeah, less mowing. Um, they, they will be much later greening up in the spring. And so there's so, a trade-off. Yes, right. There there's a trade-off. So when, what, you know, if you were growing warm season grasses and we get a frost, our our cool season grasses will be fine, but your warm season grasses will then basically go into dormancy and turn brown for the for the winter. Could you mix it? Can you when you seed? Can you do a mix? You know, the, I, I I've really never seen that in home lawns. They do that on some athletic facilities mm -hmm. uh, to do to do that, but uh, I don't know about. Home lawns. Okay, I'm going to take a risk here and uh, go to Lori, who's calling us from New Paris. If your question's real quick, we might be able to answer it for you. 
Hi, thank you for taking my call. I have a tree with the big thorns that I believe the weeds, the birds planted, and it's a fast grower, and it's got the big thorns. What is the easiest way to get, can I just cut it down, or do I have to dig out the root base? Tree with big thorns. Locus. Yes, it's, it's, I don't know, the tr the, it started growing on its own, and it has the big thorns that I think maybe like Jesus' crown was made out of. I'm not sure. They're <laughs> yeah. really long, long and... Did it flower on you yet? Uh, no, no okay. flowers. No but can flowers. she cut Just it off or yeah. does she have to dig it out? No, yeah. I, cut it on, and, and again, if it comes back up, cut it. Deplete that energy reserve under the ground. So yeah. if you cut it enough times, even if it does come back... You cut it low enough, low you can enough. over it. Uh, okay. Okay. All right, thank you so All much. All right, thank you. you. Nice <laughs> thank you, Lori. Uh, we have just a, a, enough time for j just sort of a, a take-home message. What can home gardeners do right now uh, that is going to have a big payoff next season? What would uh, you recommend? What I recommend, uh, based on an earlier conversation on water, I don't know how much rain everyone got, but it was really dry, and even established plants need water going into this uh, winter, so take that into consideration. Okay, good point, John. Okay. Think ahead. If you're going to be planting blueberry plants, you need to have that soil acidified now so that, you know, put that acidifying agent on now so that it's ready in the spring. If you need lime, put it on now so that the pH is corrected by spring. But there's a lot we can do right now that'll set us up for success next year. All right, thank you both so much. Really appreciate your being here with us. Our guests tonight have been Tom Butzler and John Esslinger, both horticulture extension educators with Penn State Extension. I'm Patty Satalia. For all of us here at WPSU, thanks so much for joining us. Have a good night.